Dating as a firstborn daughter. It's time. It's time we discuss this. Do you know what has inspired this particular topic today? I've been seeing this particular video going round, which you've probably seen it too. Because if you listen to my stuff, then your algorithm is probably going to be showing you stuff that is very similar to what I discuss. I saw this young black man. He made a TikTok and he was saying, if you're dating a firstborn daughter, you need to have money, you need to have your shit together, etc, etc. But it made me think that, isn't it fascinating that it's totally okay for men to say all the things that if I said, people would be like, this is so controversial, this is so mean, this is so unrealistic. But when a man says it, it's almost like we digest it differently and we add this level of validity to the point I'm not discrediting anything he said though because I think he's completely right and if you haven't seen that video I'm sure it'll be on your feed at some point anyway as an actual firstborn daughter I hold a lot of real estate in this conversation so we're going to get cracking because I do think that the firstborn daughters are on the pipeline to pick me but fascinatingly enough There is so much potential for firstborn daughters to get their act together and get the happy ending that they deserve. But we need to talk about why firstborn daughter is such a key talking point here. As a firstborn daughter, especially a Nigerian firstborn daughter, there is a level of upbringing, there is a expectation that is put on black women and when you're a firstborn daughter you're essentially the spare wheel the spare mother the second in line matriarch if you will so you already are if you haven't already been you already are in the position of taking care of everyone okay from early you were adultified as a young girl your mother or the female figures in your life instilled in you the belief that Not only do you need to be independent, you are responsible for your siblings. You are responsible for how they behave and any habits that you're bringing into the house will be beaten out of you because you want to come and spoil the other children with your rubbish behaviour. Or you're taught to believe that because you're the firstborn daughter, then you essentially need to be an air hostess in the house. Like, (laughs) you're, you're out here cleaning the house, you're out here doing everything that essentially a mother would be doing. Obviously, the mother still has her role. I'm not saying that you're fully rearing the kids, but there is a joke that firstborn daughters, we see each other. We know this joke oh too well, especially if you've got younger brothers. Yeah, firstborn daughters, we take credit for the wonderful behaviours of our younger brothers because we partially raised them, okay? (laughs) I'm not going to take away the credit of my mum's hard work in raising my brothers. What I will take credit for is the stuff that I taught them that my mother didn't have the tools to teach them. Because as an older sister, and as the oldest, I have a five-year gap between myself and my youngest brother. So there's stuff that I learned along the way, like street stuff and social media. Just stuff that by the time my brother is, was old enough to become his own adult, there's stuff that he's learned from me. Like he's learned the game from me, basically, right? But he has his own intelligence. He has his own wit. But I know that I've played a role in his story as the firstborn daughter, as his older sister. So I know all too well the expectation that is placed on me to look after everyone. Firstborn daughters oftentimes are the breadwinners of their household before they even get married, before they even leave the house. Yeah? So what that young man was saying in his video, where he was saying, if you're dating a firstborn daughter, you need to have money, you need to have your shit together. I agree with him because it's true. As a firstborn daughter... I have had to deprogram myself from the default positioning of believing that it's my responsibility to take care of the men in my life. I have had to deprogram myself from the belief that if a man is struggling, i.e. he's in a rough patch in his life, he's broke, he's in between jobs, he has no idea what he wants to do with his future, the word career is an alien concept to him. As a firstborn daughter and as somebody who has known the feeling all too well of taking care of people, it is in my default conditioning and hardwiring to want to help him, to want to take him on as a passion project, to almost build this man so that he can't leave me. That's what a lot of that's what I'm seeing a lot of firstborn daughters doing. And that's why 
The most radical act of self-love for a firstborn daughter that dates men is leaving men to fix their own problems. Because most firstborn daughters, they end up either being breadwinners or they're splitting bills with men because they believe that's the best they can do. I'm not seeing enough firstborn daughters putting their feet up, being loved on and not having to lift a finger ever again unless they want to. Where are they? I'm not seeing enough of that. Do you know who gets that treatment more? I think last born daughters probably find it less difficult to speak up for what they want because they are already used to bending their daddy's arm or getting their way in a household full of siblings that have come before them. So they're not foreign to the concept of I'm going to throw my weight around because I know that I can get my way. I know that I've gotten my way before in the past and authority doesn't scare me because I know how to bat my eyelids. That's a very last born daughter coded behavior. But as a first born daughter, I've had to train myself to behave like I'm a last born. Light skinned women and last born daughters, there's something in common in those behaviors where the world bends to your will because you were raised in an environment where you were made to feel like you're special. And if you were taught to believe that you were special and the environment surrounded you supported that idea, you're going to continue moving through the world like you're special. Even if you've lost some of that specialness along the way because you grew into an adult and you realise you can't say, no one's going to say yes to everything you want, there's still that element of I'm going to get my way, especially if you're a mixed race woman. So me, as a firstborn daughter, I've decided it's not my portion to take care of anybody. I'm only taking care of children and women. <laughs> As for the men, fend for yourselves. I trust that you've got this. I believe in you. I believe in you, champ. Okay? Men don't need your help. At most, give them encouragement from afar. Because if you're assuming the role of mother and leader, I just think that it doesn't put you in the position you deserve to be in. There's this phrase, right, that we use to describe what happens to men when you make them feel smaller they call it uh what's it emasculate like when you make a man feel emasculated maybe by calling him weak or by implying that he's not strong enough to lift the heavy thing or whatever you have said that challenges his own idea of his masculinity it can make him feel emasculated so that almost flattens his ego we need an equivalent for women okay Right now, I can't think of a word, but I'm just going to call it eff eff de effeminated. What is it? De de defeminated. Whatever the word is that describes the feeling of my femininity being impinged upon because I'm out here taking on roles and positions that were never mine to begin with. That, that word, defeminated, e effeminated, defeminated, whatever it is. That's, that's how it be feeling when... I'm around men who can sniff the firstborn daughter energy. I don't like that. I hate that for me. Because deep down, I think what firstborn daughters are battling with is they think that in order to be valuable, in order to be lovable, they need to be a caretaker. And I want to remind you, firstborn daughters, you don't need to fulfill a role for anybody in order to be worthy of the love that you know you deserve. Because I see it happen time and time again. Women trying to make themselves indispensable, irreplaceable by taking on this position in a man's life where it's almost like, oh, if I do all these things for him, he's going to feel compelled to keep me. He's going to be motivated by the guilt of hurting me. Therefore, he won't leave me after I've done all these things for him and his family can see how indispensable and self-driven I am in my ability to take care of everyone. His family are going to be speaking so good in my ear. It doesn't matter how much his family like you. If that man wants to leave you for a last born daughter who makes him feel manly, <laughs> he's going to do it anyway. If anything, you building that man is going to fast track, fast track his access to the women he couldn't get before he met you because you went and refined and polished him. That's why you got to leave men where they're at. And I think something that firstborn daughters are battling with is control. 
You lot have issues with control. Ask me how I know. Ask me, a firstborn daughter, how I know that firstborn daughters are battling with control issues. Hmm? I know it all too well. Because when you're a firstborn daughter, of course, you were thrust into the role of running the circus. So there is a dictator in you. <laughs> now, the problem is, you cannot control men. The, the most you can do is convince them, but control, you can't do any of that. And the ways that I noticed that firstborn daughters try to control men, like I just touched on, is that whole thing of trying to use guilt, trying to use money to control men. So that's why I've seen a lot of firstborn daughters, they end up as breadwinners. And it's not necessarily because I think these women were spending their childhood dreaming of meeting a man they're going to take care of and pay bills for. I think they ended up there because they believe that's the best they can do. And they feel that if they meet a man who is not even a quarter on their level and that man is struggling and they know as a firstborn daughter that the money that they have as a woman can definitely change that man's life, they know that they can just love bomb that man with their money. They know they can make that man feel trapped with their money. But the ways that women trap men with money is not the same way men trap women with money. I've noticed that when women trap men with money, the women who go on to become abusive and violent, the statistics are fewer and further between as compared to men who are abusive towards women when men have more money than the women that they're abusing. The point I'm making here is there's no amount of money, no amount of success and no amount of celebrity status as a firstborn daughter that's going to make a man stay if he doesn't want to be with you. Now, at the beginning of this conversation, I touched on the concept that firstborn daughters are on the pipeline to pick me. But what I didn't say was, alternatively, firstborn daughters are also, possibly, dare I say it, on the pipeline to becoming dominatrixes. Oh, who said that? <laughs> now, you guys need to let me cook while I explain this. But you see how everything I just said about firstborn daughters in terms of how from a very early age, firstborn daughters were thrust into the role of caretaker, organiser, everything running under your governance while mummy is not around. <laughs> You being, from a very early age, a provider, whether that's financial provision, whether that's you genuinely, like, being a translator for your parents, you know, because for a lot of migrant families, the firstborn daughter, who is the first generation of migrant parents having a kid that is born in a westernised country, as that firstborn daughter, who is the first in that migrant family to learn the Western language of English, you're the one that's translating for your parents. You're the one that's going to be attending doctor's appointments and translating. You're essentially an in an adult role, right? So all of these behaviours, all of the characteristics it takes to function as a firstborn daughter, these are all transferable skills in dominatrix la-la land. Do you know that? <laughs> now, the reason why I say these are transferable skills is because I see this joke where people say, if you had an older sister, you don't need rejection therapy because you're probably already desensitized by having a fucking mean older sister. And I, I second that. I second that. I agree with that. Now, if you don't know what rejection therapy is, rejection therapy, which is something that I, I believe in it. I believe in the idea of it. And I think it's something you should do if you're Fearful of putting yourself forward for things because the idea of rejection is too big for you and makes you feel really scared. But rejection therapy in the context of firstborn daughters being mean or older sisters being mean and how this links into the dominatrix slash older sister firstborn daughter pipeline thing is. With rejection therapy, the purpose is you put yourself at risk of hearing no by 
maybe asking for something that you think you might hear no to and letting yourself feel that rejection and seeing that you didn't die from the rejection. So in effect, the more you do things like that, the less scared you are of rejection and ideally the stronger of a person you are emotionally. So the joke of you don't need rejection uh, therapy if you've got an old, uh, older sister <laughs> is because firstborn daughters slash older sisters yeah there's a it could be it could be argued that we're mean but the reality is we're straight and stern because we are the matriarchs of the fucking family we don't have time to dilly dally i give very mean firstborn daughter energy when i'm dominating men <laughs> It comes so easy and naturally to me because especially as a Nigerian as well, Nigerian people, we don't have pictures, okay? Coupled with the fact that I'm a fucking Sagittarius. Fire signs, we don't have patience, bro. We don't have the patience. Oh, can you fucking hurry up? What you like, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. So if I've asked a man to do something, especially if I've asked a sub to do something, oh yeah, 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 hurry up. Don't even look at me. Look down. What the fuck, man? Like, I don't have the fear of uh, hurting feelings if I'm engaging with men as a dominant woman. At the same time, I'm incredibly hyper aware of how sensitive human beings are. And I know how to embody that empathy when I need to. But as a firstborn daughter, I'm very experienced in scolding. Okay? When mommy wasn't around because she had to go and go get the bread and I'm left in the house with the younger ones, it's me they come to if they need to report somebody and they need someone to come and mediate, all right? For the next two hours that mom isn't home, I'm the second in charge, right? So I had to learn from very early on, very early on, how to mediate between two fighting boys. I had to learn how to drop the fucking octave of my voice and be like, if I see you in that room again, in fact, let me catch you in that room again. Okay, I had to learn how to issue threats. Most of which I never had to carry out, thankfully. But the mere fear, the idea of what would happen if I catch you in that room again is enough for you to not enter that room again. I had to learn how to speak with authority and believe that the authority is mine to hold because I was given permission to have that authority by the main matriarch, aka mommy said I can. <laughs> so now that I... And mummy of my own life. Now that I am running this whole circus by myself as an adult woman, when I'm engaging with men, I am not scared. I'm not scared to make it clear I don't like that. Don't do that again. I don't feel that fear because I've spent my whole life doing that. Like, there's something interesting about being a firstborn daughter and having younger brothers. Because I think it's different if you're a firstborn daughter and everybody after you is all sisters like you've only got younger sisters you still have authority and you're still going to carry that burden of being second in line matriarch but when you grow when you've grown up in a household where you're the firstborn daughter and you've only grown in a household of, of brothers nobody can play with me nobody can play with me so the the skills apply in as a dominatrix for me and I'm grateful to have already had that upbringing and life of being a firstborn daughter because I already know I already know how to exude authority I already have it in me you don't have to be a dominatrix to exude authority when you're when you're dealing with men though this is the thing it's just about understanding that you have power you already know what it feels like to be responsible for other people and you've managed to do it very well. Yeah? You've managed to not only keep everybody else alive, you've kept yourself alive. That is no easy feat. And I'm proud of you, firstborn daughter. But you're going to need to accept that you deserve a life where you're well-rested and well-loved. Okay? Firstborn daughter is not a life sentence. Do you get? Yeah? So if you're a firstborn daughter and you're listening to this, I think out of everybody, you deserve priority access to the life you want if it was a matter of being in a queue you deserve to jump to the front of the queue because you've spent your whole fucking life looking after everyone else why would you want to spend the rest of your life doing that when you could simply pattern yourself meet a guy or guys who adore you and rest up babe rest up 
Rest the fuck up. Why are you so scared to rest? Hmm? Because this is another thing. I find it hard to engage with firstborn daughters when I can see them doing dumb shit and I'm like, you're wasting your own time. You're never going to get this time back. I wish we knew. I wish I knew. I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish you guys knew, yeah? The time you're dilly-dallying with these men, trying to uh, fix them, trying to make them see how irreplaceable you are, you're not getting that time back. You're not getting that time back ever again. But you know what's fascinating about life and time and money? In my experience, in my personal opinion, money buys you time. The reason I say money buys you time is because in the context of dating men and being a firstborn daughter, if you've spent your whole life using your time to empower everyone else, to keep everyone else safe, to provide for everyone else, to keep this whole thing running, and you've, not be you've barely got any time for yourself. If you partner wisely and you find yourself with a man who can actually financially take care of you, you won't have to be spending your time taking care of anybody. So instead you can spend your time on yourself. If you're in a situation financially where you're not responsible for your bills you're not responsible for any major expenses that you don't want to be responsible for that actually grants you more time to make more of your own money not only does that grant you more time to make your own money it grants you more time to fucking heal it grants you time to just stop take stock of everything and deep your life because you can now actually afford to stop. You've got the time. You've got the time now. You don't have to go to work. You can spend the next six months in therapy if you wanted to. And therapy doesn't solely begin and end in that one hour appointment in a room with another person. Therapy is the work you're doing in and out of sessions. So if you can afford to spend six months, at least six months, devoted to just figuring your shit out, figuring out what you actually like doing in your spare time, developing hobbies, finally putting your attention into that business you always wanted to start, but the reason why you couldn't start that business is because you're taking care of your mum, you're taking care of your sibling who's in school, you're putting, through, putting them through school, paying for their school fees in another country. You're also working this job and the little money you have left, you have to put it on your own bills. Now you don't have to worry about any of that. Now you've got all this time to focus on yourself. What will you do with that time? Because I think that's, that prospect is scary for a lot of women because they've never had to be focused on themselves to this extent. It's actually scary to have this much free time. What are you going to do with it? Because now you don't have to look after anybody. You don't have to break your back wasting your time anymore. You now have time because you've got money. So that's why I'm big, big, big on discussing money. And that's why I'm pr I don't give a f fuck how much people hate to hear me talk about money in the context of men. Because the reality is most of the people who hold these opinions towards money and men in the context of, oh, that's capitalism. Oh, that's gold digging is because they've only ever been with broke men or they've only ever been with men who have abused them, manipulated them, and the, the men in question didn't even have that much money anyway. They've never actually known the reality I'm describing because if you know a reality where you wake up whenever you want to, guys, let me tell you how I know that reality. I live that reality. I wake up when I actually want to. Obviously, if I've got plans, then I'm going to wake up in time for my plans, innit? But what I'm trying to say is, there's no job that I clock into. And that's not me trying to flex and be like, I don't have a 9 to 5. No, I still work. I work for myself. But the work that I do feeds into the life that I want to have. And when I do get money from men, little here and there, <laughs> when men do give me their money, I use it to feed into the life that I want to have for myself. So this is why I know, this is how I know. It's not about money buying you happiness, it's about money buying you time. And when you have time, you have time to explore what makes you happy. So low-key, money does buy happiness if you know where to find the happiness. 
But that's another conversation for another day. The point I am making is as a firstborn daughter, you deserve the O2 priority access. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> the, VI, the VIP priority tickets, first wave of tickets. If they was giving out tickets and they were allocating it on a limited basis of who deserves to have a well-rested life, firstborn daughters to the front, please. Thank you. No arguing. All the firstborn daughters to the front. Thank you. Thank you. Because this is the thing I'm saying about control and dominating men, right? Dominatrix or not, you cannot control anybody. You can only control yourself. So as a dominatrix, right? As someone who has spent maybe two years exploring this curiosity of, of dominating men, the most important takeaway that I've learned that applies to everything is you cannot control anybody. You can only control yourself. And the more control you have over yourself, it actually does affect the way you can control the environment that you create with other people. Like I said, you cannot control people. You can control the environment, though. You can have influence over people. And if men want to be under your influence and under your leadership or control, or if they want to submit to you, they will usually make that decision based on how you carry yourself. They can see it. So consider that. And also, while we are considering stuff, I would like to remind you that I have a Patreon. Did you know that? If you're not familiar with Patreon, Patreon is a subscription-based service where you can subscribe to your favourite creators. And how the membership works is you get exclusive access to content you wouldn't find anywhere else. In my case over at patreon.com slash the slum flower we have a one-tiered system yes we have a one-tiered system in place where everybody is paying the same one fee and over there you can find access to exclusive content like bonus podcast episodes that i'm not trying to put on the main podcast because I see how people be acting out when I, when I talk my shit, people be losing their minds. And I'm like, but I haven't even said the thing. I have not even said the main controversial thing yet. And the thing is, I'm never being controversial for the sake of being controversial. It's just the inherent nature of what I discuss, i.e. women putting themselves first, women discussing money, women sharing tactics and tools to better navigate communicating with men. All of that is inherently controversial because it does push the idea that women have power and that's controversial it'll always be controversial but that's my realm I live in and I love putting that out there over on the Patreon where I can actually share things with you guys that I know you want to see as well as the exclusive bonus podcast content you also have access to a 65 page guide called the dilemma manual and in that 65 page guide I have included anonymized dilemmas that I have received and in detail I have written how I would handle that. If that's something that you need to help you make a decision whether you should keep or leave the guy, the dilemma manual will nudge you towards the answer that you need. There is also a voting system in place where if I'm considering between two episode topics and I need I need some of you guys to help to decide what's going to go on the Slumflower Hour podcast, then over on the Patreon, people get to vote for what they want to hear about. <laughs> Outside of the voting, you can also access a workshop series, which I'm in the process of filming another workshop. And I don't want to say what the title of the workshop is, but it has been quite emotionally heavy to film this particular workshop series. Only because the nature of what I'm talking about is hard to discuss, but I know that it, it ties into the context of why we all owe it to ourselves to be a lot more considerate and careful of what we bring into our lives and the responsibilities we place on ourselves as women. The best part of my Patreon is actually the group chat as well. There's a fire group chat that's going on. It moves at the speed of light. There's so many of you guys, you're in there encouraging each other, supporting each other, giving each other pointers and tools and tips on how to navigate certain very nuanced, very specific situations. And I love it there. I fucking love to see it. So if you're curious and you want to be part of this disobedient, deviance portion of the internet, patreon.com slash the slumflower is the place you need to be. Now back to discussing firstborn daughters. Dear firstborn daughter, your desire to fix men is costing you years of your life that you are never going to get back. 
Dear firstborn daughter, just because you want something to change, it doesn't mean it's going to change. So if you really, really want a guy to change and you really, really, really hope that you being nice to him and you overextending yourself is going to make him change, that's not what's going to make him change. Do you know what's going to make a man change? You leaving him. And even then, he won't fundamentally change as a person. It's just that the energy and the power dynamic will change between you and him. That's it. You can't make anybody do anything. And what I would say to firstborn daughters as well is, instead of using your energy to be trying to fix other people, you need to channel all of that into fixing yourself, babe. All that money you've been sending men, all of those bills you've been splitting with men, all of that extracurricular time you've been giving men, helping them build, giving men life-changing business ideas that those men have gone on to execute and make money without you. Imagine if you'd put all of that into yourself. And lastly, all of that time you have put into men. Imagine what your life would have looked like by now if you had put all that time into yourself. Hmm? I see women who are on the same, pretty much same path and position as me in regards to like career. You know, I've seen influencers or public figure women who are smart, beautiful, accomplished, well networked and they're lugging around these broke boys because that's the best they can do that's the best they've convinced themselves they can do actually let me watch my word in there because words carry power there's a difference between that's the best you can do and that's the best you believe you can do just because you believe that's the best you can do it doesn't mean it's the best you can do just because you believe you can be a breadwinner doesn't mean that's the best you can do for your life. Why would you want to do that? After all that hard work, after all the time you have spent breadwinning for your family, you want to now breadwin for a man. For the Why? Everybody wants to believe that they're the exception. I'm telling you guys, I'm not saying this to be bad vibes. I'm telling you this as somebody who has been lucky enough to be exposed to a wide array of women from various age groups, lifestyles, financial positions, celebrity, non-celebrity. I'm telling you, everyone thinks they're the exception, but it's the same pattern. It's the same pattern happening on an existential level. The existential pattern happening here is if you as a woman are the breadwinner, that man is going to cheat. He might not cheat one year into you guys being together. No, he might not even cheat five years into you guys being together. But if you're with him long enough, at some point it's going to happen. But men who choose women who are doing better than them financially are men who are really good at hiding their cheating. Because those men know that they get by on overcompensating and the breadwinner wives lap it up. They eat it up because let me tell you why, yeah? And I'm being really careful with my wording when talking about this because, first of all, I have high respect for women who are in a financial position where they can even take care of a whole grown adult man. Do you know how hard you have to have worked to have that much bread? You're a don. I, I salute you. I salute you. Breadwinner women, you guys are dons, but I feel like you need to get out of there. <laughs> you need to get out of there as soon as you can yeah because <laughs> I promise you that man is cheating the reason why I am standing 10 toes and 32 teeth down that that man is cheating is actually I don't even have 32 teeth because I had four premolars taken out when I was 14 but anyway I'm standing 10 toes down and 28 teeth down the reason why I believe it in the depth of my bone marrow that as a breadwinner your man is defo cheating and defo pinching somebody else's breast is because men when they feel emasculated, they go where they feel masculine. I know people don't really like all this masculine, feminine, uh, feminine gobbledygook. I don't like it either. I'm not going to lie. I don't really enjoy talking about femininity and masculinity because it feels too rigid. But at the same time, it is what it is and it will exist whether we acknowledge it or not. So the reason why I am of the 10 toes down, 28 teeth down belief that 
breadwinner wives or breadwinner girlfriends are being cheated on by the men who they're looking after is because that man's going to go where he feels like a man. And I'm telling you, the money you're giving these guys for their stipend and their allowance, I'm telling you now, they're sending it to women. And it's even you're going to be even more pissed to hear that not only are they sending the money that you're giving them for food to women, they're sending that money to women who call them a little bitch. You need to ask me how I know. You need to come and ask me how I know. Do you know how... Oh, Jesus. Chai. <laughs> <laughs> Guys. I have a background in adult entertainment, okay? I also have a background and a deep knowledge in sex work and navigating men who pay women for certain experiences as a dominatrix. Because dominate dominatrix falls under the umbrella of sex work, right? We need to call it what it is. As a dominatrix. Hmm. Chai. I've been to kink events where I've met men who I ask them like, so what kind of night are you having? Like, did you come with friends? Like, what's the situation for you? When did you realize you were submissive? You know, I'm trying to probe and just understand what I go on in it. And these men will tell me, I had one guy tell me that this, um, this time that he stepped out tonight. Um, yeah, he, his, his girlfriend just had a baby. The baby's like three months old. So why are you here giving your money to women? I've met men who are legit married, married, still wearing, they don't even take off the ring anymore. They're not even, guys, just let you know, when these men are cheating on you lot, they don't even take off the ring, you know? They're not even taking off the ring no more. These guys, and when I say cheating, yeah, because I consider it cheating if a man gives another woman money. I really do, babe. I really do. That's why if you go into dating men with the preset belief that at some point he's going to cheat, you're not going to feel distraught when it happens, bro. You're going to be like, give me my money. Run me reparations. Run it to me. Because I don't, I don't respect marriage because men don't respect marriage. That doesn't mean that I don't respect wives. It's just that I don't respect married men. They don't value marriage, guys. Especially the ones who enjoy being bitch talked down to by powerful women like myself. That's why I don't, that's why I barely respect men. Like I see men as human beings that are deserving of the most basic level of, you know, citizen respect. You know, I'm not going to throw an apple at your head in the street because that would be considered grievous bodily harm because I throw the apple really hard if I could. If I was allowed to, I throw the apple really hard and make a dent in your cranium. But seeing as I can't do that, um, I'll give you the basic respect. You know, I'll walk past you. I'm not going to do anything to you. But guys, do I, if you ask me on a deeper level, do I respect men? No, I don't. No, I don't. They don't respect marriage. They don't respect their breadwinner wives. Stop giving these men money. They're giving the money to women on the internet who they haven't met, guys. Stop doing that. Stop giving these men money. Do you know what these men are doing with your money that you're giving them? You're out here organizing a stipend for an adult man. Stop doing that. Stop it. Put a stop to it. Because I'm telling you, you know what they're doing? They're buying videos of women um, twirling their toes in front of the camera, being like, you're not even good enough to sniff my feet. And these men are pre pressing buy now, buy now, buy now, buy now, buy now. And I, there's nothing wrong with buying those clips because I, I support women. Yes, you should support her business. Thank you. <laughs> support her small business. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, you think as a breadwinner woman that like, oh, I'm doing such a good thing. I'm, I'm not only am I an empowered girl boss who can run a whole family, I'm also running my man's life. No, you're not, girl. You would actually be better off having your children. If you're so hell bent on having children, have your children. Because you know what? I believe you. Yeah, if you've got the money for it and if you've got community, you need both. You cannot have just money and have kids and think you're going to be able to thrive on your own in my personal opinion. But you also cannot have just community and then have kids and think you're gonna, no, you need both money and community. If as a woman, you've got money and you've got community and you genuinely wanna do this motherhood thing without a man, I am standing 10 toes and 28 teeth behind you. I, you have my support because you, I know you're gonna have help, I know. But if you're out here being like, Oh, I, I, oh, look at the time. Oh, 
I'm getting geriatric, even though that word I think is just scaremongering on purpose because we don't call we don't call um, sperm owners geriatric for being past 35 and nothing inside people. But anyway, look at the time. Oh, I'm getting that geriatric age past 35. And I really, really want to be a mum, but I haven't met the person that I want to start a family with properly. I guess I'm going to have to just let my situation ship not inside me and I'll keep whatever he leaves inside me and then we'll just make it work. You don't just make it work with a child. Guys, you don't just have a baby because you are horny. You don't just have a baby because you find your man cute. I'm saying all this because if you're a firstborn daughter, it's easy for you to think you can do it. It's easier for you to believe, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not like I haven't already looked after a whole family at age 15 by myself. Why do you need to put yourself through that again? But 10 times worse with a snotty crying baby that has trapped gas and probably has some sort of issue that you can't figure out what's going on with the baby. Now you're worried. Also, you've got postpartum depression. You don't have community. Even if you do have community, you don't have a partner though, because in them sleepless nights, in them nights where you're creating fucking rotors and timetables on who's going to get up and tap baby's back and walk baby around so a baby can finally lie down for two hours and, and close baby's eye. Who's going to be doing that with you? Because I promise you, your best friend, your homegirl, yeah, she will be there to be part of your community, but she's not doing them shifts with you, babe. The man who impregnated you needs to be there with you. And if that man is jobless and you now can't work for a while because you've got fucking nine inch deep stitches and it's doctor's orders for you to be home for at least three months, where is the money coming from, please? Because that's how I see it happen. That's how I see it happen where, and I'm not shaming the women who they don't have any choice because it is what it is. You're here now. Do your best in it. What I'm saying is if you're in a position where you haven't done it yet, you know, there's no, you're not pregnant yet. You're not bound to any broke man yet. You still have time to jump ship, babe. You still have time. You still have time to change your mind. You don't have to do this. It's not mandatory. You can, oh, you can change your mind, babe. <laughs> I'm talking to those women. Because the breadwinner women who are already in that situation, look, hats off to you for being really strong, but I wouldn't do that for myself personally. And I feel really scared talking about breadwinner wives. I feel scared talking about married women or married men. I'm always scared because the most wrath I've experienced is from married women. I think married women are really scary. And I find breadwinner women very, very scary. Like, I know you guys can fight. And I know that if you guys could jump me, you would. <laughs> All that frustration that you can't take on that man, you'll give it to me. I know you would. I know you're going to beat me up and still stay with him anyway. That's why I'm scared. I'm always fearful for my life when I'm discussing the antics of married men. But someone's got to say it. And the reason why I think someone has to say it is because there's this belief that if you have your shit together as a woman financially, then that makes you some sort of prize. I'm here to tell you now, you don't even need to have your shit financially together as a woman to be a prize, you know. You just need to have the mentality of somebody who has her shit together. And the mentality of someone who has her shit together is a woman who carries herself like no man is good enough for her a woman who carries herself like any man who wants her desire her love her attention needs to work for it the woman who knows how to carry herself so high that if a man wrongs her he she's making money off of that you must think this is a joke guys you must think this is a joke and that's why money is a huge running theme for me throughout the topics discussed on this podcast because money is important Please try your best to avoid listening to the people who say things like money isn't everything. Believing that money is important in a relationship is just another extension of capitalism. To that I say money isn't everything but neither is love. That's why you need both. And to the second point of valuing and prioritizing money is an extension of capitalism no it's not I think that's a conflation of two very different concepts because as a woman dating poor men keeps you poor and men are a tether men are a tether to the life you could possibly have for yourself men are a linking point to the level of social mobility required for you to leap through different lifestyles and you, you call the shots. It's because you don't know how to call the shots. That's why you're scared. And what happens is when you get scared, you choose the safer option. And the safer option 
for a woman is to be the breadwinner. Because if you're the breadwinner, nobody can financially abuse you. What you'd think, you would think as a breadwinner woman, no man can financially abuse you because he quite physically, literally hasn't got any money to hang over your head. But I see it happen to women all the time where they're still getting financially abused by broke men. They somehow, these men somehow manage to get into your minds and coerce you guys to give them your money. What is going on? How are you being held under siege by a man who didn't even finish past GCSE level? How are you being outsmarted by a man who you're more qualified than, so much so that you're the breadwinner. You need to ask me how that's happened. Let me tell you how that's happened. To me, it's the same thing as letting a kid outsmart you. But when you let a kid outsmart you, you're doing it on purpose because you actually care about that child's feelings and you don't want to be a prick to a child. So when a five-year-old tells you, hello, tomorrow I'm going to space and I'm taking all of my stuffed animals with me and in space, we're going to have a rocket race. Yeah, and the rocket race is going to be fun. And, and, wait, I haven't finished. We're going to have a popcorn machine in space. Yeah, and I'm going to live in space for six months and, and I'm going to have all of the sweet snacks I want to have. And to that small child, you're going to be like, really? Yes, you will go to space. That's so cool. What colour is your rocket going to be? <gasps> Red. And what about the two other rockets? What colour are those rockets going to be? Oh, another red rocket? Okay. Oh, and a blue stripes one. Ooh, you really like red and blue, don't you? Yeah. Oh, okay. And how many stuffed animals are you going to take on this rocket? Five. Oh, only five? But you have lots and lots and lots and lots of stuffed animals, but you're only taking five? Why are you only taking five stuffed animals to space? Oh, because each stuffed animal is in charge of one of the rocket. Oh, okay. Wow. Seems like you've got a really robust plan on when you're going to space. Wow. Can I come? Can I come with you to space? I can come? Oh, yay. Lucky me. That's exactly how it looks when you're talking to a five-year-old who's gassing up the ting. But the problem is, the five-year-old represents a man who is not even nearly as qualified as you are in any aspect of life. But instead of for you to just let the five-year-old cook and just play into his little game and stimulate his imagination, you're falling for it. You actually think that five-year-old's going to space. You're asking all these unnecessary technical questions like, but you're five, how are you going to go to space? Like, girl, it's literally a man. How are you going to let a man who didn't finish school past GCSE level outsmart you, a PhD holder? You have multiple degrees and a master's and you're on six figures and you're letting a man who didn't finish school outsmart you and collect money from you. And you're the one that's worrying about keeping him. Something isn't working. And that's why I think firstborn daughters have a lot of work to do. Firstborn daughters need to learn how to own being a savage and firstborn daughters need to learn how to stay away from broke men because firstborn daughters are already pre-programmed to mend broken wings of birds that have fallen from the sky. Firstborn daughters know how to sniff out men who need help and they will help them deep down because they have a desire to, to receive that help. Firstborn daughters are at a predisposition where they want love, they crave love but the way they go about it is thinking that if they give someone the kind of love that they want to receive, then that person's going to feel compelled to give it back to them. Not with a man. If you want to do that with women, then, you know, you can explore being queer, see how that works out for you. I don't have much to talk about in terms of queerness. I haven't been with a woman yet. I'm not really sure how to navigate that. I'm not really in a place where I'm curious about that. I think women are very attractive. But I respect you guys too much and I could never fathom treating you how I treat a straight man. Unfortunately, it is my comfort zone to be a menace to straight men and I'm currently enjoying it here. Um, but I like to look at you guys from afar and I think you're all very beautiful. And if you ever want to tag team on dominating these men, then let's fucking go. But aside from that, I don't have it in me. I don't have it in me to be mean to a woman. But to be wicked to men, let's go. When I see men who are um, one broken wing, why are those men looking for women to date? Why are they dating? How come when a man is on his last battery of life, yeah, he's gluing himself together with sellotape and blue tack? He's literally falling apart. Why is it that's when he decides, you know what? Now will be a perfect time to make a profile on a dating app and put myself out there. Put yourself out there for what? Why are you polluting the environment? You have nothing to offer a woman. So why are you making a profile on a dating app? Because you want to procrastinate. 
because you want to run, run away from your problems. And you know what's crazy? Do you want to know what's fucking mad, yeah? I've had scenarios tenfold where the woman is the breadwinner and for some, some God-blessed reason, the Holy Spirit provokes her to look at his phone. So she looks at his phone, come and see message upon message that he's sending girls, he's sending nudes to girls, he's receiving nudes from girls, he's, he's having sex with these girls. You, I'm, they're seeing text messages, oh, la last night was fun. When, I, when am I seeing you again? Oh, yeah, let's put Tuesday in the diary. This same broke man who cannot find two pennies to rub together. This same broke man who is, oh, he's, he's depressed and that's why he can't find a job. So I'm going to just hold him down while he figures it out. But he's able to uh, fuck women. And also, I'm really confused as to how broke men are able to have so much pussy. What are they saying to you guys that's resonating? I'm not understanding this. It really bothers me because... Broke men are so able to cheat, right? They have so many options. And the reason I keep on saying that these men cheat is because they go where they feel wanted and desired and manly. And they're using the clouts and the clothes that you're buying them to go and cheat. Hmm? That food that you're cooking for him, that's what he's using to line his stomach so that he has enough energy to be doing cardio and pumping somebody's pussy with his dick. You gave him that energy. You gave him that vim. You gave him the belief that he could do it. So he did. Yeah? Hmm, chai. <laughs> That's the issue with firstborn daughters. You lot be dimming your own light to let others shine. And I hear it, I get it, because as a firstborn daughter, I know the feeling all too well of allowing myself to just blend into the background and let everyone have their moment. It's that second in line matriarch thing. It's just like when you imagine a mother, like imagine a mother on Christmas day. Think about that scene where all the kids are opening their presents and the mother is just like standing to the side, like watching them open their presents, watching them be excited. Oh, thank you, mommy. Oh my God, yay. Like she gets something out of seeing that reaction from the kids. She doesn't need the kids to wrap her a present because the kids are four. They're not old enough to have any money to buy no presents. They don't even know how to wrap anything, but she just gets by on the joy of being able to do that for her kids, right? Especially if she's a single mother. Fucking hell. But I do feel like a lot of firstborn daughters are single mothers anyway. Like, <laughs> and I don't mean single mothers and you've actually got a child. No, I'm talking about when you was in that household being the firstborn daughter, you was the mother in that situation I just described where you're watching everyone open their presents. Nobody fucking got you a present. Ask me how I know that reality. There were, there were Christmases when no one got me anything and I got everybody something, and I'm standing there to the side, just like living off of the joy of watching everyone open their presents, and I didn't get nothing. And I, and I convinced myself to believe that the joy that everyone's gotten from me breadwinning is, is that's my Christmas present. I'm, I've since snapped out of that, that's not my reality anymore. I'm in a loving environment now where I do get presents on Christmas, praise Jesus. But there was a time when that wasn't my story, you know? And I do believe that there is something about dimming your own light to let others shine. And there's something about deliberately feeling like you need to step out of the light so that other people can be in the light and you find some sort of virtue in being the showrunner. Why? Why do you want to be the showrunner when you're the star of the show? Why are you doing that? Because you know what? Another thing that pisses me the whole hell off about firstborn daughters is firstborn daughters are so hard on themselves, but they're so easy on men. You guys be having visual flashbacks of shit you can't forgive yourself for, but you're so forgiving of men. I would like to understand how that works, because it doesn't work. But that's another thing that you need to deprogram. These are things that firstborn daughters don't really get to hear. We don't really get to talk about this, but this is the reality. And I do think that if you're dating men, you've got to be vigilant. It's something you've got to pay attention to. Because that can hinder you. And I've seen it happen to the strongest of soldiers. I see men, right? They're drawn to women because they can smell that firstborn daughter energy. They can smell that she's going to pay my bills. She's going to split bills with me. You need to learn to be offended when a man thinks you're going to split bills with him. And you also need to learn to fish for that information from the onset. You need to find out how to do it. Find out how to make jokes. Find out how to listen to what he's saying. Find out how to be a good conversationalist. You need to become a journalist when you're, when you're dating these men. 
start asking questions that lead to other questions so that you can get a character profile of him and you get all the information you need to know if you should even spend another hour with him. I'm telling you, bro. Don't go off a man's looks. Don't just go off of, oh, he's good looking and he wears Carhartt. Please want more for your life because a man is not his looks. A man is provision. A man is a provider. I don't give a fuck, yeah, how much people have been convinced to believe that, oh, because we live in a capitalist society and because we're in a recession, therefore we need to be easier on the men. No, we don't need to be easier on the men because pussy is not mandatory for the human experience to be complete. Dating is not mandatory for the human experience to be complete. You don't have to sleep with women and you don't have to date anybody for you to still live a fulfilling, colourful, vibrant, nourishing life. Pussy is optional. Dating is optional. Men can live without dating, but clearly they're not able to. It's very fascinating to me that women allow themselves to be used by men day in and day out. But the idea of using a man back, you're now remembering morals. What has morals done for you? Do you know what morals are for? Morals are for, I don't believe in hitting children. I don't believe in being unnecessarily rude to old people. And the key word is unnecessarily because some of these aunties be trying it. But, you know, I don't believe in being unnecessarily rude to old people. Morals is, I believe in treating people with respect and it can be cordial, it can be amicable if we're not on speaking terms. But my code of conduct is I'm going to be a pleasant human being when I need to and I'll dip if I don't need to be there. That's morals. Morals is not, oh, I'm a nice person, so the moral thing to do will be to just accept this man as he is because he said he's trying. He said he's, he said he's working on it. <laughs> he said he's going to. Really? He said he's going to. What does going to mean? Because last week, just last week, I said I was going to retwist my dreadlocks and I didn't. But I was going to. But I didn't. <laughs> the same way men be like, oh, I was going to, I was going to buy you flowers. Okay, so why didn't you? You lot be letting these men get away with going to. You lot be giving men special treatment based on what they said they were going to do. Did he do it though? Did he do it though? Because firstborn daughters, yeah, are so traumatized by doing everything for everyone else that the mere mention of a man saying he's going to do something, you treat him like he's already done the thing. Instead of to have pace and patience and practice self-control, let that man do what he said he was going to do. Let him live up to the game he's talking because men know that they don't even need to do the thing that they said they were going to do in order to get the benefit of doing what they said they were going to do. So what that means is if a man says, oh man, I'm going to get you these flowers. I just seen these flowers and they're so beautiful. They remind me of you. I'm going to get them for you. I'm going to get them for you. And I'm, gonna, and I'm also going to buy you that bag you said you liked because I know, I know how much you wanted it and I just can't wait to see that smile on your face. Him saying that to you, and if you're someone who has never had a man treat you good and you're used to looking after men, the mere mention of a man saying he's going to, you're going to give him pussy because of that. You're going to start being extra nice to him because of that. He's already gotten the result of what should have come from him doing the thing because if he had bought you the flowers that he said reminded him of you, if he had bought the handbag that he said that he knows you really liked, then you're well within your right to decide how you want to show your gratitude, how you want to display your excitement, how you want to express your happiness. And it's totally normal to want to express your happiness sexually. <laughs> okay? But all this, I'm going to, I, I was going to. But you didn't. And now you're not going to see me as a result. There. Done. So please, girl, if you're a firstborn daughter, I implore you to get up, stand up, stand up for your rights, <laughs> your right to be taken care of, your right to call the shots in your own life. And I want you to release that fear of if I ask for what I need, I'm not going to get for I'm not going to get what I need. I want to let you know that that's actually true. Yes. If you ask for what you need, you're not going to get what you need if you're asking the wrong man. If you're asking the wrong man, of course you're not going to get what you need. But if your comfort zone is canoodling with broke men, you're also co-writing that self-fulfilling prophecy of, I don't get my needs met by men. But you're not finishing the sentence. 
I don't get my needs met by men who cannot afford to meet my needs. So you're answering your own question. You're solving your own problem. Of course he can't meet your needs because he can't even meet you at your level. So if your comfort zone is staying in the familiarity of what you can control, i.e. broke men, you're not going to get your needs met. You will remain unhappy in relationships and you will constantly feel like something is missing, but you will tell yourself, but I guess no one's perfect, right? But that's the problem. When you position the life you deserve as perfection, you're never going to go out there and get it because you've told yourself it's perfect. And we all know perfection is unattainable, but it doesn't need to be perfect for it to be fulfilling. And that's why language matters. That's why words mean things. And that's why the way you talk to yourself underpins and sets the tone for the mindset that you will have moving forward. And your mindset is everything. Your mindset is everything. And I don't think you're paying enough attention, babe. So to wrap this up, I want to say to all the firstborn daughters, I salute you. Gang, gang, spud me. Let's fucking go. We got this. I pray that you don't put yourself in a position where you have to take care of men. That does not have to be your story. Remember, you deserve a well-rested life and you can still work for yourself in a way that's authentic to the life you want to have because you will call the shots and you'll still be rested and both can coexist. In Jesus' name, amen. And to the breadwinner wives, I'm really, really sorry if, if me being direct has upset you. Please don't jump me. I, I'm not that man, okay? Any vim you have for me as you're forming the sentence you're going to type in my DMs, just go and say it to that man. Because if you don't have the guts to tell that man to fucking get a job and get out, then don't chat to me, in it. And if you're already too far gone and you're married to him and it's become legally techy, I'm sorry to hear that. My advice to you, I won't even call it advice. You don't need my advice. You got this, champ. But I would say a suggestion if you're ever considering being being a wild card of a woman which i know you got it in you make sure you cheat upwards cheat with a man who has so much money that when this becomes a case where you have to divorce and you're going to walk away from some money because you married a broke man and he's going to be financially and legally entitled to some of your earnings the man that you've cheated on him with can replace what you lose in that settlement just saying cheat smart you have the pussy. You will always be smarter than a man because pussy is a man's downfall. All you got to do is just flash a pussy in a man's face and he's very susceptible to your influence. So do with that information what you will. Thank you for listening. I hope you got something useful out of this episode. Like I said, all my love goes to the firstborn daughters. We fucking got this. We are strong. We are brave. And no man formed against us shall prosper. Thank you for listening. Take care, and as always, I'll catch you in the next episode.